Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to Tamora Presbyterian Church this morning. Uh, it's really good to see you all this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Paul and like to extend a warm welcome to you all. Um, it's really good we can meet together on Sunday mornings and read the word and pray and think about our Saviour Jesus today. And I just thought it'd be a lovely way to start by reading from Matthew uh, chapter 11, verses 28. Uh, this, is what, this is what Jesus says. Uh, it said, at that, at that time Jesus declared and then says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, says Jesus. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. So may we do that not just today, but also this week. I invite you to uh, pray with me now. Thank you, sovereign God, for your mercy toward us. And we can only approach you through Jesus, our Saviour. Lord, you are amazing. And much, almost everything of what you do is beyond our comprehension. You formed the world, you made the planets, you formed the stars just through your speech alone. You are so magnificent and amazing that humans cannot look at you and live. Forgive us so often for making you and degrading you to a God in our own image, which isn't revealed in Scripture. Please forgive us for so often treating you as if you were a human like us. Please forgive us as a congregation for our many sins, corporately and individually. Perhaps we've avoided big sins if we were to classify them, but our minds are so often self-absorbed and self-focused and self-centered. Please forgive us. Please help us as your church to think rightly and highly of you and also rightly of ourselves. Please forgive us for our lack of love, of joy and of patience, among other things. Please teach us to put you first each day and others second and ourselves third. Thank you we can meet together now. Please use your word to challenge us, to change us, to convict us, and to make us more like your son, Jesus. Please help Derek as he shares later on from Romans 1. Help him to do it correctly and faithfully as he ought. Uh, and please help us to use your word as a guide for our life. Uh, thank you. We can, have, we can have it in our own language. Uh, we pray we will grow in cherishing you and it as well. So we commit our time this morning to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think Kynan's going to come and do a Bible reading now. Thanks, Kynan. Today's reading is from Isaiah chapter 44, verse 9 to 23. All who make idols are nothing, and the things they treasure are worthless. Those who would speak up for them are blind. They are ignorant to their own shame. Who shapes a god and casts an idol, which can profit nothing? People who do that will be put to shame. Such craftsmen are only human beings. Let them all come together and take their stand. They will be brought down to terror and shame. The blacksmith takes the tool and works with it in the coals. He shapes an idol with hammers. He forges it with the might of his arm. He gets hungry and loses his strength. He drinks no water and grows faint. The carpenter measures with a line and makes an outline with a marker. He roughs it with uh, chisels and makes it with compasses. He shapes it in human form, human form in all its glory, that it may dwell in a shrine. He cut down cedars or perhaps took a cypress or oak. He let it grow among the trees of the forest or planted a pine and the rain made it grow. It is used as fuel for burning. Some of it he takes and warms himself. He kindles a fire and bakes bread, but he also fashions a god and worships it, worships it. He makes an idol and bows down to it. Half of the wood he burns in the fire. Over it, over it he prepares his meal. 
He roasts his meat and eats his fill. He also warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm, I see the fire. From the rest he makes a god, his idol, he bows down to it and worships. He prays to it and says, Save me, you are my god. They know nothing, they understand nothing. Their eyes are pl plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think, no one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it I used for fuel, I even baked bread over its coals, I roasted meat and I ate, shall I make a detestable thing from what is left, shall I bow down to a block of wood? Such a person feeds on ashes, a deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Remember these things, Jacob, for you, Israel, are my servant. I have made you, you are my servant. Israel, I will not forget you. I have swept away your offenses like a cloud, your sins like the morning mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing for joy, you heavens, for the Lord has done this. Shout aloud, you earth beneath, burst into song. You mountains, you forests, and all you trees, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob his displays and glory in Israel. We're going to continue our time worshiping God in prayer. There are many things we can be praying for. The HSC has started for year 12 students. And so let's pray that our students would study diligently for God's glory and whatever they remember, whatever they learn, hopefully it directs their gaze back to God to know he is the creator and he made the world. And many other things as well to pray for. So let us come before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Father, you are our creator. You're our sustainer. You are the one who has created the world with all its intricacies to function the way it functions. And thank you that you have given us minds that allow us to study this universe and this world. Study all sorts of things like mathematics, uh, biology, chemistry, English, literature, all sorts of different things. And we thank you for the education system. We thank you for the ability that we have to learn about your good creation. We pray in particular for all the year 12 students around Australia are currently studying and undergoing the HSC exams. Please, Father, we pray that students wouldn't be overwhelmed by stress and overwhelmed by pressure. We pray, Father, that students would find their identity not in their marks, not in how much they know, but ultimately we pray that they would find their identity in Christ. We pray that everything we learn, everything we marvel at in creation would direct our gaze back to you to know that you are the creator and you are the one who has created such a wonderful, a beautiful creation. Father, when we think about this creation, we recognize that we do live in a fallen world. The world does not function as it was always intended at the good beginning. And so we see floods, we see droughts, we see natural disasters. Father, we pray especially for those who are suffering in our country as a result of floods. We pray for families who have lost loved ones. We pray for families who have lost businesses. We pray for families whose homes have been devastated by the waters. Father, we pray that you would withhold the rains. We pray that you would be with families who have been affected we pray that insurance companies would speedily provide the financial payouts needed for people to resume and restore uh, their lives and livelihoods. Please be with the government as they uh, allocate aid to where it is needed most. We pray that you would in particular be with the SES as they do what they can to support uh, people who are in need. We pray also for churches that you would be with them as they seek to do what they can to support those in need and direct people's gaze to your loving kindness. Father, around the world we continue to pray for situations of tension and war and conflict. 
If it is in your will, we pray that a road to peace would be found speedily between Ukraine and Russia. We pray that the conflicts would not escalate. We pray, Father, that peace would be found. And we pray, Father, that even though we do live in a world of suffering and pain, we pray that people would find reconciliation and hope at the cross. We pray, Father, that you would be with world leaders, give them wisdom to negotiate a path forward. Father, we want to thank you that you hear our prayers. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that even when we go through hard times of health difficulties, financial difficulties, whatever the difficulty might be, we thank you that you are loving, you are good, you are in control. And we pray that we would cling to the promises of Christ, knowing that if you are for us, who can be against us? And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning's second Bible reading comes from Romans 1, verse 16 to the end of the chapter. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what they ought not, so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. So again, morning everyone. It's good to see you all. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, besides next week, which uh, we're having a special service, we're going to be looking at the topic of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 to 7 on the topic of uh, sexuality and different aspects of human sexuality as well. And there's a book before I begin the message I'd like to recommend to you. So it's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to the Sexual Revolution. So if you're very keen to understand the context of where we're at from a Christian perspective, I really want to encourage you to consider reading this book. I found it really helpful, and a lot of uh, 
Uh, different things in today's sermon will come from this book as well. So why don't I pray, and we're going to uh, get into the message. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Scripture, and we pray, Father, that today as we consider the context of where we're at in society, you would give us wisdom to know how to apply Scripture well. And we pray, Father, that you would be with me. Help me to speak what you want us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the highlights of my fortnight or month or week is Thursday Bible study. I really, really genuinely love and appreciate our Bible study on Thursday mornings. So if you have time on Thursday, I really want to encourage you to come along and join us. I remember a couple of months ago, we were talking about how sexualized our society had become. For example, sex before marriage, cohabitation, uh, transgenderism, all sorts of things. And in our group on Thursday, we were considering how did we get here? What happened? Uh, how did the world change so much over uh, the decades that we are where we're at today? And today, uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, is my very brief attempt to answer that question. How did we get here? How did we get here? Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be considering different aspects of human sexuality from 1 Corinthians 6 to 7. And I think that it is really, really, really important to get the foundations right, to understand why it is that God has created us as sexual beings. Otherwise, we fall into the danger of moralism, legalism, thinking the Bible is all about do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. You see, as adults, we do get really concerned at least I get concerned when gender ideology is taught to little children, isn't it, in primary schools. It's concerning when sexual behavior outside of the Bible is normalized for our children. But what if it's being normalized in us? When was the last time we were taught and considered God's purpose for human sexuality? Are we subconsciously absorbing all the messages that the world has without thinking about it? How do we teach our children about God's vision for human sexuality if we ourselves are confused about it or if we haven't thought, of, thought about it? Today's sermon, I need to be upfront, it is primarily about context. If today's sermon was a 40-minute sermon, today's sermon would be 20 minutes, uh, as in the first half. And so... Uh, in order to apply the Bible correctly, I think we do need to know our context and where we're at. And so uh, there will be some biblical reflection at the end of today's sermon, but if you're thinking, oh, it doesn't seem like there's that much uh, exegetical work, uh, then you're probably right. And so how did we get here? Uh, there's so much that we could consider. There's so much that's been talked about uh, by people. But I think that today we're touching the tip of the iceberg. And I think for our purposes, there are three themes we need to consider. The first one is the dominance of expressive individualism. The dominance of expressive individualism. Every now and then you'll hear cliches being thrown out and catchphrases. And I'll repeat, I'll say some, and maybe you've heard these yourself. Be true to yourself. Follow your heart. Find yourself. Follow your dreams. Pursue your passions. Do what's right for you. Has, any, has anyone heard those before? Like at least those catchphrases, those movies? We've heard it all before, don't they? All of these phrases have one thing in common. It's all about you expressing who you truly are. For some of us here, for some of us in high school, it's always been that way. But the truth is, it hasn't always been that way, has it? In times gone by, our primary commitment was not to expressing ourselves. Our primary commitment was to our family, our community, our church, our nation, our God. But that's all changed now, hasn't it? That's not our primary commitment anymore. Modern sociologist Robert Bella, he calls this expressive individualism. And it's this idea that every single person has an inner core that needs to find outward expression in order for the individual to be truly authentic and real to himself. Describing expressive individualism, Carl Truman, uh, sorry, just a picture. Describing it, Carl Truman says this, 
Modern man seeks to be true to himself rather than conform, conform thoughts, feelings, and actions to objective reality, man's inner self itself becomes the source of truth. Each of us seeks to give expression to our individual inner lives, rather than seeing ourselves as embedded in communities and bound by natural and supernatural laws. Authenticity to inner feelings, rather than adherence to transcendent truths, becomes the norm. You see, the inner self is absolute today and needs to find outward expression. That's what society values today. A hundred years ago, a politician, if they were caught swearing, they would probably have been fired or at least heavily reprimanded. But today, especially in the heat of the moment, that's highly valued, isn't it? Especially in our prime ministers. Why is that? It's because they're being authentic. It's because they're being true to themselves. It's because we're seeing who they truly are. And that is what our society values. And one thing that's really contributed to expressive individualism, apart from ideology and philosophy and other things that you can read about, is technology. Technology has really shaped our society. Globalism, planes, medical procedures, the internet, has all helped in allowing people to shape themselves into being who they want to be. Expressive individualism, it's the culture that we live in today. It's got its pros, for example, careers, we choose our own paths, don't we? We don't have to do what our parents did. But it's also got its cons. It's the world we live in. And it also affects the way we do church as well. You see, just think about church music. Think about your favorite songs. What are your favorite songs? It's not the songs that benefit the church as a whole, but most likely your favorite songs are those that make you feel something and have some sort of special meaning to you. And notice also the shift in language in the songs that we sing. It's not, it's not often the corporate we anymore. We're not singing songs that have the word we in it, but actually the songs we sing, the pronoun is predominantly what? It's I, isn't it? I worship you, I love you, God, I this, I that. It's all about me and my personal relationship with God. Expressive individualism means we go to church not primarily to encourage others, but we go primarily to be encouraged, to get something out of it. Worship becomes entertainment. Attending church becomes a desire for personal intimacy, relationship, experience with God. We go to churches that suit our worship style. We enjoy listening to sermons that suit our preference. And there are a myriad of, of other churches that we can attend if the church isn't suiting us. And that's why people can even sit at home today, watch services online or listen to the radio and think that they've been to church because church primarily isn't about the community worshiping God. It's about the individual, sadly. And that's not what the Bible says. And so how did we get here as a society? Firstly, the dominance of expressive individualism. But secondly, the sexualization of self. The sexualization of self. Now here's a thought experiment, which I don't believe. What if central to our core and who we are is our sexuality? It's not our family, it's not our nationality, our career or our religion, but central to our inner self and who we are is our sexuality. That's what a very influential part of our society holds to, and that's what is constantly being promoted today. You see, if expressive individualism is the flavor of our society, and we need to find outward expression of who we are internally, and central to my inner core is my sexuality, then in order for me to be authentic and real and true to myself, I have an obligation to live out my sexuality. Does that, does that make sense? I hope, I hope you're following. You see, marriages break up because a man or a woman, they discover that they're actually attracted to someone else. And so their obligation isn't to their spouse, it's not to their children, 
Their obligation is to expressing their feelings, who they really are. And that's why today in society, you will see it. You see it everywhere. There's so much emphasis on sexual identity, isn't there? People identifying as gay or straight or bisexual or so forth. That's why sex is everywhere. It's not just in ads. Sex is on TV, on shows, but it's also in schools, isn't it? And that's why modesty, there's no such thing as modesty anymore in today's day and age. Because it's all about sexual expression. It's all about me expressing who I truly am. And if I want to dress in a provocative way, however I'd like, then that's for me to express. And if that causes offense to someone, then that's their problem, not my problem. There's so much emphasis, sadly, on sex because life's most intense feelings are believed to be sexual, and central to who we are is believed to be our sexual identity. Carl Truman, in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, he starts off the book saying that the sentence, this sentence, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, would never have made sense 50 years ago. I am a woman trapped in a man's body. But today, for many, it makes very real sense. And to deny that reality would even get you labeled a homophobic, no, transphobic. You see, that's expressive individualism, outwardly expressing who you believe yourself to be inwardly. And technology and change in society has also rapidly assisted us in getting us to where we are today. Let me give you some examples. No-fault divorces have allowed people to more freely get out of relationships that they weren't happy in. The contraceptive pill and abortion allowed sex to be divorced from pregnancy, meaning that sexual activity was now free of the consequence of child rearing, and sex becomes a plaything to be enjoyed casually. Research into hormones now means that there are puberty blockers that you can take to appear more feminine or masculine. IVF has really helped women who have struggled to fall pregnant. But it also means that because of reproductive technologies, it's changed people's choices, hasn't it? Some people can now choose more freely when they might want to fall pregnant. And now, not only that, we have gender reassignment surgeries as well. When anatomy, where anatomy, sorry, can be removed because of someone's internal inclination. But it's not called gender reassignment anymore. Does anyone know what it's called? It's called gender affirmation surgery. Now, that's what it's called today. It's called gender affirmation surgery. Why is that? It's because a person is just expressing who they really are, and they're just conforming their body to that. And so how did we get here? Firstly, the dominance of expressive individualism. Secondly, the sexualization of self. And thirdly, the overthrow of sexual oppression. You see, what's now considered sexually normal used to be the minority, if not frowned upon. For example, homosexuality, sex before marriage, transgenderism, abortion. And it's fair to say that sexual minorities, over the decades, they have faced uh, their share of difficulty and oppression, haven't they? And that is something to be uh, lamented if they have been unfairly uh, ostracized and uh, inflicted pain. The first Mardi Gras in Sydney in 1978, it was a protest movement arguing for gay rights. Now, we don't want marginalized groups to be oppressed, do we? Jesus loved the marginalized. Now we've moved from the past. We love justice as a society. We love equality. We love the marginalized. But here's another big if which I don't agree with. What if it's the traditional structures of society that are leading to the oppression of the marginalized and preventing people from expressing their inner core and sexuality? What if it's the traditional structures of society that's actually hindering people from expressing who they are? And who are the two main culprits? What's enemy number one that's preventing people from expressing their sexuality? 
There's two, I believe. The first one is the nuclear family, and secondly, it's the church. Now, let's talk briefly about the nuclear family. When I say the nuclear family, I mean a family with a husband and a wife who are married and have children. Now, even if people aren't actively trying to destroy the nuclear family, which some people are, there is a large contingent in our society trying to normalize all sorts of other relationships. And what I'm saying shouldn't surprise you. When you're watching TV, a TV show, how often is it that someone gets married before they have sexual uh, intimacy? Any TV show, any movie, do people get married? No. TV shows like Modern Family normalize what's not normal. Sex today is not exclusively for marriage. You can live with your partner who you're not married to. Same-sex marriage and relationships are acceptable. Divorce is acceptable. You see, people normalizing what the Bible doesn't consider normal. Now, I do need to say that we do live in a broken world where sin does sadly damage relationships. And if your family, if your marriage, or if your relationships have been damaged or destroyed by sin, then we grieve that. And we want to be a church that supports you and loves you. But we shouldn't be normalizing behavior that's contrary to scripture. And so that's public enemy number one that society says needs to be dismantled, you know, the nuclear family. But public enemy number two is the church, isn't it? With its views on sexuality. When Christians say that marriage is between a man and a woman because it reflects the union between Christ and the church, and that the ideal family is one that's lived in submission to God, and children should ideally be raised in the context of a loving father and mother, and that sexual union is between a husband and a wife, that makes us the enemy. That is not appealing to society. Christians are killjoys, think Ned Flanders on The Simpsons, and Simpsons go back decades, doesn't it? Christians are hate-filled homophobes. Christians are transphobic. Christians are bigoted. Christians should keep their views of sexuality to themselves because everything they have to say is irrelevant, especially because they speak against sexual expression, which our society today sees as the core of human identity. You see, in today's day and age, the church always does find itself butting heads with society, doesn't it? Just think of about those um, big topics that get discussed. For example, abortion, euthanasia, same-sex marriage, transgenderism. Why is it that the church is constantly butting heads against these uh, big movements? It's because these big movements are an outflow of expressive individualism. Abortion. Who are you to tell me what I can and can't do with my body, discarding the fact that the baby inside you is not your body, but another body? Euthanasia. Who are you to tell me what drug I can and can't take, or how I want to die? Same-sex marriage. Who are you to tell me who I can and can't marry? Transgenderism. Who are you to tell me what gender I can and can't be? You see, it's all an outflow of expressive individualism. Who are you to tell me what my inner core is and how I can express it? So what then? Let me share with you some biblical reflections. You see, what would the Bible say? What would the Bible say about expressive individualism? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Following your heart is really bad advice because your heart is tainted by sin. You see, just because your heart feels a certain way, it doesn't mean we have an obligation to live out those feelings. Instead, as people made in the image of God, our obligation should first and foremost primarily be to who? It's to Christ, isn't it? 
Romans chapter 6, verse 18. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. You see, Jesus owns us now. That's our core identity. That's who we are. That means we belong to him. And that means the core of who we are is not our sexual identity. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. You see, our sexuality is important, but it's not the most important thing there is. And it's far from being uh, central and most important. But we are one in Christ. We belong to Jesus. Let me read 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11 to 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits. You see, the Bible does tell us that we are sojourners. We are exiles. We are strangers in this world. And because of that, we should expect to be ostracized. We should expect that people won't agree with what we believe and hold to. You see, here are some questions for us to consider. What do you do when your workplace tells you to sign a code of conduct embracing diversity and homosexuality? What do you do when it's diversity day at school and you're, in sc you're at school and you have uh, no idea uh, how you should respond to your friends? Or what do you do when it's diversity day at school and you as a parent have no idea what they're teaching your children? What do you do when it's Pride Month and your whole workplace is forced to wear a rainbow shirt, badges, and t-shirts? What do you do when your kids are watching play school and they're normalizing what's not normal behavior? What do you do when you're a Christian struggling with same-sex attraction? You see, these are real-life questions, aren't they? Real-life questions that require real-life wisdom from scripture and it's not always easy and it's not always black and white but it's the world that we live in isn't it you know maybe i haven't convinced you that we need to spend a couple of weeks looking at the topic of human sexuality but then here are some other questions for us to reflect on what's shaping the way we think about sex sexuality and gender what do we do when everyone at high school around us is sleeping around? What do you do when you're in a dating relationship and your partner wants to move the relationship more towards a physical direction? What does the Bible say about singleness? How do we think about divorce? How do we think about same-sex marriage? Maybe you're a widow. Your spouse has passed away. Your longing for deep, intimate connection. Why would God implant these longings in your heart? Is he cruel? You see, these are all questions that if we're not seeking answers from the Bible, guess what? Someone else is going to seek an answer for us. And that, I believe, is the ruler of the power of the air. Ephesians chapter 2, the spirit who is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And so if we want to understand biblical sexuality, we need to go back to scripture. We need to look at Jesus, Jesus who was perfect human, fully God, fully man. Jesus who had a sexuality that wasn't tainted by sin, but always honored God. And so today's sermon or message has primarily been about context. I just feel like it saved me so much time having to refer to our context week in, week out. And it's a confusing place we find ourselves. And that's why over the next month, we're going to be looking at God's purposes for human sexuality. And I really want to encourage you to attend in a fortnight's time to hear the message on God's purpose for human sexuality, because that's like part two of today's sermon. And my hope is that looking at this topic from the Bible's point of view will equip us to see God's goodness 
and glory in his purpose for us. Let's pray. Father, we do live in a confusing world. We do live in a world of expressive individualism where people are constantly seeking to express outwardly what they believe themselves to be inwardly. We pray, Father, that instead we would seek to submit ourselves not to our heart's desires, but to your word. So please convict us of sin. Please be with us. Please humble us. Please work in us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.